Sundar here and I'm from Ingram Foundation. Um, we have been thinking and talking with many of you, not all, about this session for a while. So I'll just give a brief background and an idea about what this session is about. Um, um, so the planning and the thinking for this session happened almost close to six to nine months, but it is probably just last two months that we thought, why don't we just utilize the opportunity of the Emit Data program to start a broader conversation. And that's what this session is about. The conversation is about little bit opening the envelope from a focus on human health. And here very specifically, we are talking about water, water quality, water contaminants in rural areas. And the larger uh, conversations are usually around how these contaminants are affecting us and definitely it should be. And we are far from reaching the point that um, people in rural India are safe from water contaminants. But having said that, in different conversations over last one year, many anecdotal you know, stories and experiences, observations came about saying, why are we just focusing on um, us you know, at the center? What about Dr. So then we actually started going about and talking with people. One of the points which emerged was that it is not just about the health of people, but actually livelihoods of people in a broader sense in rural areas are maybe also connected in a very strong way to uh, the safety of water and water. Now, while this might not come as a big surprise, it is why we talking about it. Um, but actually, when we actually went around and spoke with people or researchers or in this program, in the program and others, we realized that um, there is not much of such kind of conversations at say policy level or programs or any kind of uh, articles, yes. So for example, we found that some publications such as Manga Bay in the last year or two have been bringing about these issues very strong. So media has started to talk about uh, issues that we're going to speak in this session. And that's the point we felt that let us do some exploration for a few months, um, open observations, and then come up with this session, which kind of brings a fresh thought. So that's the idea of this session. I think we have a great set of people. I'm so happy to see all of you here. 10.30, I was scared and I wrote messages to you. So it is good that, you know, we could attract all of you to this session. Uh, with this background, I pass it over to Anush. Uh, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. You don't need the information. Good morning and uh, thank you again uh, for attending this session. Like for the world is explaining that at Tata FB, uh, we have so many different teams uh, finding a space for water quality. I think it was quite a bit of a struggle and I really want to congratulate you that you need to make that happen. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, thinking of uh, you know the presentations and the speakers we have, I guess we are aiming for a lot of education, a lot of new information, a lot of new perspectives. But more importantly, I was telling from the time we reached out outside, uh, as a work professional, at least for the last 15 years, whenever we spoke of water quality, I would say almost 98% of the time I might have ended up talking about the prevention, the detection, the how to remove the contamination. And that's the that's the way of looking at water quality and from a very health-centric and human-centric way. And saying, okay, uh, this is affecting uh, cattle, it's affecting livelihood in multiple other ways, it's affecting agriculture. So instead of looking at agriculture, you know, that might be causing the contamination, but also saying, how is that getting affected? I think there are multiple new possibilities, just this reframing, saying how water safe are through the livelihood presence. And I'm very happy. And in the interest of time, uh, I think we should just get going because there are some new presentations and uh, the caveat here is the sample may not be very bright. This is just like Sundar was saying, this is just opening the envelope. 
getting the conversation started, but we need to hear saying what is it that the team has found. Let's go into the presentation. Uh, do I have a list? How do I invite first of all? Okay, perfect. <laughs> what is it? So the program brochure has in the list of thank you Anuj and uh, as you're saying you know it's uh, right that uh, over here uh, it's more of the questions that we are asking and we feel that uh, sometimes we need to ask the right questions right so that's what the title says how what a safe for rural life and also that's what the Picture says here, okay. and uh, I don't think that this would only be my observation, but what we are increasingly uh, seeing is something that at least I was not seeing a year back. Now I don't remember who it was who asked me. After which, whenever I'm going to villages, now I'm seeing, I said, "What is what are animals doing? What is the cattle doing?" And then. Uh, I'll come to another interesting picture at the end of the, uh, towards the end of the presentation. They are um, kind of at the tail of where we end, in the sense that all these water supply pipelines, you know, there's a rush for it to move and water comes and sometimes one hour and sometimes once in a few days. So after all that, after all the struggle for water, you know, people actually trying to get water in their home or in the stand post or wherever, there are those drops which are falling off from it, right? So that is what you see, whether it's a hand pump or a water source. And that's where the cattle, the livestock, animals all around, that's what they are drinking. So they are drinking the same water. What I mean to say here, they are drinking the same water. Does it affect them in a similar way? What are our perceptions? We have heard a lot of different, when we actually went about, we, we got a whole range of perceptions of people. You don't know how tough uh, pigs are with cows. I mean, it's a whole new conversation that we are having now. Um, so that's the idea. This uh, this uh, particular session, mine is a little bit heavy on data and maps. Even for me, I am trying my best to consume what is there even on my slides. So please bear with me. That hopefully you know I give justice to the information that has you know, come up. So before we begin, just two slides about us. I think we still deserve a little bit attention. Um, and I don't think that today in the session uh, with um, Libby and others, I think we are going to talk about Jalji Mission and what is really going on. And uh, is is everybody in rural India drinking safe water? I think we have a lot of time for that. My simple answer is no, but we'll all talk about it later. But for people who are coming new to water contamination, I just have a few bit of slides to just get all of us eased in. As to when we actually enter villages, when we go to farms, wide landscape and things look so nice, right? With water which is clean and so why is contamination even happening? Uh, one is about the fact that India, uh, very few countries like India where our primary source of drinking water is still the groundwater. I don't know the numbers. We see a lot of numbers ahead in this presentation, so I don't want to put more numbers percentages here. Um, a huge part of rural India still drinks groundwater. And groundwater is diverse because of so many, so many types of rocks. And as we go deep, deep, deep and exploitation, you get more mineralization and contaminants. So that's one story. The other whole story is a lot of different types of waste, right? Waste from cattle. Uh, agricultural waste, pesticides and others which are getting in, which are not just by themselves, but they are causing other reactions inside. So I'll come to new contaminants that are coming up. They are coming up not necessarily because we are putting them in. They exist over there, but the new things that are going in are releasing them. A prime example being uranium in water, which was already there in rocks, but they are getting released now because of other stuff going so it's a lot of mix of all kind of things that is causing contamination. But how does it look like across the country? I don't think this map is so easy to read. So I mean, this presentation and PDF will share. But what it says, 
across uh, the country. What it tries to say, each dot is one district, roughly. And what it tries to say is that which is the top contaminant of that district. This is based on whatever I'm going to be presenting here is based on broader public data, government data coming from accepted uh, public information systems. So you see here that uh, iron and arsenic are more on the Indo-Gangetic Plains, Eastern side. You see little bit of salinity on Gujarat, Rajasthan and the coastal side, but um, not much of it. You know, as much as I would have expected, you don't see salinity so much on top in the other places. Fluorides on the Rajasthan or Andhra kind of side. So broadly some trends that we would expect as people, some of the people <clears throat> working on these issues. Um, but some surprises for me in terms of why certain districts showed iron more than salinity. I'm, I'm also thinking. But this is the public information. And uh, many of us who have kind of calibrated this particular data set and kind of ground truth, uh, I still have more trust on this than what I download today from the current tokens. So I'm still using this this from around four or five years back. And this this is a little bit more trustable, at least you know, for anybody needs it, you can share this data. But apart from this, there is a whole other world. So the last one that I mentioned here, uh, less than 100, feet, 100 meters, starting from Punjab, but now across the country, you're seeing things like uranium come up, some other place. The more we measure, the more we are seeing. So that's the whole world of contaminants. I will not go more than this right here. But this map and this data, I'll use constantly around in this presentation. And especially the next one, uh, again, uh, I'll share the um, data, I'll share the methods and go into it. For now, let us consider this as an index of how water quality is severe across the country. Right? It is an index of severity. So you see some bright red spots in Rajasthan or some parts of Madhya Pradesh, but going down to Andhra Telangana. But then you see a lot of blue spots also across the country, which are relatively low on the water quality index. Lot water quality index is something which weighs some contaminants more than others. Arsenic would be weigh weighed much more than salinity. It is tedious is always in our mindset, right? It will dissolve solids. But then it is not as severe in terms of health for probably anybody on an average as let us say arsenic. So arsenic is weighted more. And that's how this index is there for a person. There are many ways to calculate this index. I have done it in one particular way. I'm ready to share again the data in spreadsheets. So with this as a background, so this applies to humans, but since we don't have any other data set, we'll also use it for the other you know, risk mapping and see how it pertains to other aspects. Any questions? So this groundwater. So again, a great point from Manoj is that this is still groundwater. It's not surface water, it's not ponds. Um, and this is primarily also um, most of the rich data that is available. So, so. But yes. Yeah, this is it. yeah. so this is, uh, it, it is, it is available. It is in the back, back end of this data set, but yes, it's more direct. Okay. Um, so I think we are all here because um, we probably are thinking about this particular, you know, these points that we put in here that uh, why are we even talking about things which are, you know, beyond uh, the first photograph that I shared is one introduction to that. It's because animals are also now increasingly drinking uh, the same water. That we are. I'll give two examples. One is, uh, I think Imanshu some years back uh, showed um, a tiger from one of the parks in Maharashtra. Now, even the water trucks inside reserve forests are this groundwater which is pumped out. So they are drinking the same ground. The other thing is uh, gear uh, lions uh, having dental fluoroses. Fascinating. I mean, I, uh, so we spoke with one of the dentists who is doing that, wanted to actually go ahead. We don't know how they do the study, but uh, gear lions having dental fluoroses is something. Okay. So this is lions inside gear forest, but then obviously buffalo and uh, camels and goat. The second thing is, I mean, we should be concerned for about ourselves because food is produced from this. Um, so, I mean, that's the second point. And the third thing is definitely that, you know, we, we have this whole earth model, right? Earth as the absorber right from our childhood in school. Um, there are limits to it. 
limits to nature. So for me, these are some broad questions about why we need to go to the next slides. I'm sure there are more. And this is one starting point that we want to put that rural livelihoods also seem to be dependent on uh, clean water availability. Now we want to understand that better. Is it true or is it uh, how far can we take it? Um, and uh, the difference that we are seeing is that the criticality of certain livelihoods to water and clean water is different from other livelihoods and in certain places. So this is another thing that uh, uh, we wanted to you know, look at in terms of mapping this criticality. That is, how is this linkage you know, different uh, from one place to another? And uh, how can we actually map it out um, across the world? So with this as a background, I'll go into each of these three major issues. Right? Um, so in terms of rural livelihoods, what we are looking uh, at in this session and also the observations all across is one, uh, agriculture. Uh, second, uh, animal husbandry, and third is fisheries. But broadly, when we are seeing fisheries, we are looking, looking at the health of village water bodies, uh, primarily that. And in that sense, nature also comes in when we are talking about uh, fisheries very broadly. Um, the imagination that we are having, at least the observations that you will see in further presentations, is more on the upstream side. What we mean by upstream and downstream here is that putting rural livelihoods in the center, how does water contamination affect rural livelihoods? So let us say um, uh, a buffalo drinking very high saline water. Right? How is it affected? Maybe it affects the milk output. Um, but how is cattle waste from the same buffalo farm affecting water contamination beyond downstream? Right? Um, so in that sense, we are trying, trying to kind of differentiate between rural livelihoods at the center. Um, how does water contamination affecting rural livelihoods and rural livelihoods affecting water contamination? And a whole list of issues put down here. I don't think I'm going to go into you know, particular details of each of them. And in this session, we are not looking at all of them. The observations have been mainly on the upstream side in terms of how is water contamination affecting these levels. Um, so with this as a background, I'll go into each of them. And also what we found was that some understanding, some acceptance, some standards do exist. So if you look at human water quality in terms of human consumption, there is something called the Bureau of Indian Standards. I think all of us, many of us know about it. There is a, um, a list of around 35 or 38 contaminants and some standards for human beings. So do we even have that for um, for crops? Do we even have that for animals? Does it even exist? Um, so we started exploring and trying to. Agriculture obviously has accepted you know, some kind of standards, which are more oriented towards certain crops and certain crop productivity. You see this whole list over here. Um, and then there is a broad acceptance of certain crops being more sensitive to certain parameters. And there is a lot of literature on it, a lot of understanding on it. The whole ICR system has some attention to it, I believe. But beyond that, now we started looking, uh, remember at the start of the presentation, I presented this map of water contaminants, groundwater contaminants, and also this index. So now I'll start using that. Sorry. I'll start using that um, as a kind of a background towards looking at how agriculture also might be uh, getting up. Um, so before that, some broader numbers. I'm sorry if, um, because I, I don't think um, I have a hold on these numbers, but these are the best figures that uh, we could you know, access from sensors and other figures. Um, it seems that there are on how you look at it between 60 to 100 or 120 million farmer families, 90 or so. Total area irrigated, everybody has different uh, estimates on it, 140 million hectares or so. And then um, Imitada program would rather go for an 85% groundwater irrigation. I, I believe 60% is the minimum, uh, but somewhere around that, at least 60%. So this is the kind of uh, range of scale that we're talking about in terms of this uh, scale of crops and this scale of groundwater irrigation and the contaminant water quality index 
uh, which came. Next slide. Um, I'll just pause here because these are estimates that we are trying to. Uh, so what we try to do over here is to look at the major contaminants. As I said, fluoride and arsenic are major, and also they are a little bit more severe. And we look at habitations which are affected in each of the districts in the country and the average size of the habitations. What might be the irrigated area over there? Put them together and sum, sum it up. So we are getting some broad figures which say that fluoride arsenic on one hand and salinity on one hand. We are talking about something like 9.5 million hectares which may be exposed to water contamination from the irrigation. So why is that important? One we, understand, one, we, one we understand is the food chain and possibilities there. But other important thing here is the soil. It's because soil accumulates the uh, water, um, the content of water. And actually, we don't know what is happening. So what, what happens when arsenic gets into soil? Does it get decomposed? And quite possible that it's getting maybe decomposed. There are maybe natural processes that are happening within soil. Just an area, there is some work on it, but just a broad area for us to think about. These are broad numbers. To actually think that why this may be really important uh, for us. The next slide is more about putting these together at a national scale. <clears throat> so what we do here is we use what is called the agricultural census. The agricultural census gives us a uh, groundwater irrigated area in each district. So for example, this district here would have something like 60% area irrigated with groundwater, and the rest there is canal water also from here. But if you go east from here, 100 kilometers, 150 to Daho you might get a very different feature. Rain fed and groundwater irrigated might be maybe 30%. So that's what the groundwater, um, the agricultural census gives you all approximate, but that is what we have. And then we have the water quality index from before. We just put it together and then try to find which areas of the country might be at a big risk from groundwater contaminants and food production. That's the next map. Again, map warning, because I, I, I found it a lot of time a lot of time to try and understand you know, which district where and what is happening. <clears throat> and the way in which we weighted right, all of this is we gave fluoride and arsenic more importance. And that's why you get Rajasthan and West Bengal in the top 10 districts of the country. So it depends on how we gave importance to what. Right? I mean, I'm, as I said, this open data and analysis I'm ready to share. Uh, so you do your own analysis and you know, figure out. But this is what we get from a broader kind of picture that certain districts appear to be at more risk than others and um, from certain contaminants. In terms of crop production, possibly food production, but I think what is more important is soil. And that will maybe be more important in the future for us to understand as to what is. So this is mostly uh, what I have about agriculture <clears throat> and the potential impact is as I have already mentioned. But one thing I think we also need to understand is about the potential impact on nutrient content within food, right? One is about toxins, sorry, but also about what is happening to the nutrition um, content of food produced from, say, high fluoride oil. So this is the uh, second, uh, of, uh, I don't think you see the two tabs. So there are two tabs here, the situation I was talking about. The one, the bottom one over there, the, the red one over there, it has around 4,000 TDS, right? 4,000 TDS, it is a water supply in a village nearby from here, where water runs constantly in the photos. There is a lot of 4,000 tedious water to just you know, leave. Um, there is a tap over here, which comes possibly for three hours a day, or, um, or sometimes you know half an hour a day. Um, I think the photo maybe is not captured in the problem. One, the, the tap is a bit problem. Now, cattle don't touch this water, this 4,000 tedious water. So they wait for people to get done that half an hour or one hour of this, and then the trip drops. So we saw, you know, how it happens you know, over time, over few hours. So this is, I think, situation in some places. One of those dots you saw on the map. These are the situations if you see that. Very surprisingly, there are water quality standards for animals. I mean, we, uh, it was quite surprising for me. And uh, I'm just put it out in the figure. The countries which follow it are. Obviously, New Zealand obviously follows this because dairy economy is so important. So it and it seems that dairy economy is influenced by the quality of water that cattle should be. So I think here maybe there are people who would already know about it and might be acting about it. We haven't had those conversations with this institution. This is not readable. <clears throat> this is maybe a little bit more readable, 
but that's not the idea for you to consume it. I'm just putting it here so that it is there in the slides. So it seems all of these contaminants are also important for animals. Right? And I don't know how many, uh, I have not been thinking about it. I want to hear from you how much we have been uh, talking about it. The other whole thing about what all goes into animals to do, right? plastics and others, uh, we can come to that. Okay, so what do I do here um, is take something called the livestock in census. So livestock census I found is fascinating. It has data on 650,000 villages. Each village data, it was so tough for us to analyze it. There was so much data and I didn't need that data. And it talks about the kind of animals in each village, uh, domestic animals in each village. And I think it's a rich data source which we all should be uh, looking at for different purposes uh, that we want to work. So we take the same livestock census data, take it to a district level, the same water quality index we have before and put it together. But first, we'll try to understand about animals. I, I, I got to understand a lot more about animals from the census. We have something like this, around 400 or 500, 400 to 500 million uh, animals around us in villages. I think it's uh, uh, close to 40% or close to 30% of our population. Uh, the rural female animals are counted, not male. Um, I found it interesting. I was not able to get from any, I mean, there is village level data on rural female animals, uh, but not male. A lot of interesting things. I think the gender, uh, uh, gender is reversed you know, with, uh, with uh, cattle and the way we play God with, uh, with cattle. Um, very interesting thing once we start looking at the data. Now, the next one again, map warning, two maps together. But okay, let us look at this one, right? And let us look at what is this about. So it's again like the same one where each district is the um, highest animal in that district. So if you see piggery is uh, the yellow one, and where do you see piggery? On the edges side, right? Buffalo you see in Gujarat and you see a lot. Cows in some parts of India and some expected trend, some unexpected. So again, I think very interesting. This by itself to look at, but uh, what was more interesting for me goes to the village level. You can, I just did anecdotal uh, and many other people. It was not bad. The data set was actually quite interesting. The other one is this is a total population, just to give a broad trend, but I think the map is not, the color, color scale is not what everything looks red. Uh, but what we are now doing here is to juxtapose this with the water quality that we have over here to again try and see where are the risk zones. Uh, not very surprisingly, the manner in which we have gone about it, we get very similar response as to the top 10 districts and that. Uh, the root data is different, groundwater irrigated and here animals, but broad trends are what we get. So what do we understand is that certain parts of the country, maybe the animals are at more risk than others. And um, maybe we need to explore and go deeper into these parts. We just use a cutoff of 75% on that index and came to something like 131 million animals, which are possibly at a higher risk than others. Why 75%? We can use another sort of risk. Um, and there might be from our field evidences, we are um, talking about lifespan, reproductive health, dairy output, poultry output, and all that. I think there's a whole world to discover within it if it's already not yet discovered. Okay. Uh, this is a village called Barazda here in Anand district. And this is a photograph from uh, 2005. And uh, 2005, this well was operating. Um, there was There is this pond at the back, beautiful pond. This is what I found in 2005, uh, that there is a wastewater line you know, going into this pond. And I keep going back to this, this photograph. I keep using it. And I keep talking about it, this interrelationship, drinking water, waste, pond, and all that. I went there three days back. The well has changed a bit. Um, the pond has changed a lot. It almost doesn't exist. The back end is not a farm, it is a pond. Right? Spilled up. And this is not one village, right? It is um, the ponds are getting harder to spot. And, and we are ready to occupy the space on that on that pond, right? I mean, even yesterday I saw someone saying that there are like three or four ponds in a village, and one of them is the wastewater receiving pond. It's, it's a standard 
accepting acceptable you know sort of a thing now how does it matter in this conversation let us you know sit back and try to understand but there is a um, firstly let us look at the quality standards right so this is 1977 there was a directive a b c d e uh, a b c d e uh, standards right but then uh, sometime around in 90s or so a b c d e got little bit more qualified i think that is not well put out right it there is little bit more qualification for a b c d e so a is like drinking water quality who is going to drink rain water today uh, uh, river water today or no pond water but they still have this classification um, i just put some highlights here but i have the entire if anybody is interested i can share the entire directive and you know, all the uh, so now these are the standards may maybe supposed to be following it exists so i don't think i think in the say in the case of animals there is a lot of advocacy for people to maybe doing like standards for water quality here it maybe exists it is already is existing in policy how can we start looking at waste water villages and ponds and how does it matter so there is this uh, wonderful report which came year back and it has started the conversation on water bodies some numbers you know last numbers it might be plus minus 2.4 million water bodies the total volume is interesting it is around 10 billion cubic meter in this water body. so remember this 10 billion cubic meter because i am going to come again back to that in the next slide so there are some number of water bodies some million and some big number 10 bc it will all be off here and there but it is the this is a, this is a beautiful report i think the first one of its kind which came last year from ministry of culture now again back of the slide calculations not i mean this all approximate uh, the interesting thing is if jal jeevan mission succeeds Right, if everybody gets fifty-five mil PCD, and I mean the standard drainage wastewater figures are much higher, I think in urban seventy or eighty percent, but I just put it much down to fifty percent. That is water supply converting into fifty percent of uh, wastewater. That's coming to around nine billion cubic meters. So in the earlier slide, we have a potential capacity of ten BCM, and here we have nine BCM potentially of rural wastewater now. these are big numbers we already see that happening in areas where water supply is coming already you are allocating one pond that is getting filled up like the food of before and the pond getting filled up why should we care at least for fisheries or something or at least for the water i'll come to that in the next slide so these are comparable numbers if not in 10 bcm and 9 bcm now interesting points why do i bring it here i think some people here know it <laughs> alka is smiling right? anybody else why am i bringing um, cookware and washing machines or more of this things to buy cookware anybody who is to watch forever. Forever. forever chemicals thank you so much uh, so uh, non stick cookware are contributing something called polyfluorochlorinated aromatic substances we are in a state of denial in india today but non stick cookware is like so easy to gift and to absorb it is very aspirational right in every family and obviously the pen rural penetration is of non stick cookware is much higher than washing machines it seems washing machines grow the market grows in rural areas every good monsoon so and we did a little bit of very little bit of understanding on the market penetration so washing machines now will grow with age right now it's 7% rural penetration if we have like three good monsoons until then jjm ka pani to aayega teen saal and washing machines don't go away you know once they come and it's important also in terms of women labor some areas are already picking up so now why are washing machine important not just for the volume because we are getting more water efficient washing machines but the top load detergents and all that and that's why i think it's more important non stick cookware is now i think at 5% and expected to grow 18% but i think non stick cookware will grow at, you know much faster easier thing to these are two i think trends which i think we need to be looking at along with waste water volume from jjm one number which from rural livelihood perspective uh, is the 783 crores which is the uh, rural inland pond culture fishery market or the economy that is in village ponds at least in the western part of india i think now across the country village ponds are given out as auction and there is a whole um, privatization of village ponds and fisheries the overall economy of that is around 780 crores that is what is the wastewater you know getting 
a lot of numbers. I'm just summarizing some of the numbers here. I, I, I warned you at the beginning that there are some numbers here. And the other number is that I'm out of time there. Uh, but I'll just conclude here in the sense that uh, that is a thinking behind uh, what is coming about from conversations to look at communities as a whole or looking at what is safe or what is safety, not just from a human health perspective. Can we start? It cannot be everywhere, but can it start? Then can this conversation start in some places? I mean, it's not possible for many communities to even think about it. Um, and uh, thinking beyond lifeline water to productive needs to ecosystem needs. Um, it's just a you know, introduction and thought, a food for thought you know, from here to broaden uh, the subject. Thank you so much. Apologies for both you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Anush, how should we go about it? Um, the, this was the entire package of the presentation. So are there any more? So there are, um, there is a lamb is presenting after that, and then there are uh, two case studies after this. I think we should hear all the information. Sure, sure, sure. The informed decisions with the panelists. I think a lot of this information is here for you to opine and even connect with your experience that it's better to consume with your presentation. But my request would be if there are three section case studies in one presentation, that's right. Yeah. And anywhere between 30 to 40 minutes max, because yeah. then. We have panelists for a reason. Yeah. Sure, sure. My apologies for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. See that uh, this thing now, yeah, things are heavy, right? Okay. So, should I, uh, I have it downloaded? Yeah, maybe we can. Can um, I use the download? Yes, yes. I think that would be better. That's why I was worrying like whether it would work or not. Actually, it's there in your drive. Huh? This one. So maybe this is faster. Yeah, definitely faster. And then, you know, it, if we go offline, that would be faster. Yeah, this is offline. Slide show. From the beginning. And I'll just put it here. This is interfering with this thing. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think it's almost noon, but yeah, uh, I'll skip the major part of the explanation of why we did the study because Sir has quite vastly and that he has explained in details why we are doing the research. So uh, mostly I would uh, say that, yeah, Inram and IHP have been doing some work on uh, water quality and how it is impacted on a rural livelihood, but then our focus area or are on different sectors. Like Sarah have already mentioned that we are uh, looking over the different activities, maybe the crop production, the animal husbandry, or the aquaculture or the uh, fishery. And like, of course, uh, more stock of the town that is the drinking water. Overall, we had in the site selection, we conducted a sur uh, survey in 15 districts uh, covering nine states. And uh, the number of samples we could get was 812. Please don't be overwhelmed by this number because we it was just a feedback that we took uh, because we wanted to know how many of these households are... Okay. Then you just share it. So what is what are the middle? Yeah. Is it correct? So uh, it was majorly done to find out 
how many of these households are aware uh, of, the, of their water quality that they are consuming every day? Or of the water quality that they are giving to the animals or the one they are using for fishery? So moving on to that, we had some, sorry, it's not moving, but yeah. <laughs> It's fixed. Uh, no, it's okay. So we, after doing the, uh, re, uh, taking the responses, we found out that awareness, regarding awareness, 87 of them were aware. They were aware. And then out of that 87 persons, 75 persons have tasted the water. But then uh, after testing the water, we also need to know uh, that we need to get the awareness. So for that, Around 48% have received the training. But waste management or water purification, how many of them have adopted? It was just 32%. And from this, it doesn't mean that all of the family that uh, who are aware or who have received the training were managing waste, mat uh, waste material or they were doing uh, water purification. It was not like a direct equivalent relation with, between the two. Then that means there are some underlying uh, factors that is making the unaware or untrained people for, uh, do some kind of management practices. It may be the literacy, but that we are not sure because we need more research on this. And because this kind of understanding, because uh, we know that every story has their own script and we believe that there is an underlying script of that story, which we need to dig out. And uh, with this uh, stories, we can build up some social learnings, which we can carry forward for more scaling up in different areas. Going one by one on water quality and the impact on the activities. I would first come with drinking water because when we did the survey, everybody was more focused on drinking water. As I said, it's talk of the town. So it doesn't mean that, like uh, many of, I'm sure many of us have gone to the field and when offered a glass of water in the field, sometimes heart must be wrestling. Whether should I accept it, drink it out of respect or whether I should be cautious because the water may not be safe. So that thought always rests up and you are not wrong in having a second thought in accepting that water. Because... We see less than 50% of India's population has access to clean water. That means it's high chances that the water they are, you are about to drink may be unsafe. So on this side, they have their own household uh, measures to uh, steps to do the purification. Uh, one of them from our study, we have learned that they were saying that we use cloth for sieving. And then we have some kind of filter, uh, uh, biofilter, that they have made on their own. And, uh, or like, it's just the self-motivated uh, methods, but then besides that, there is external support also. And in the external support, Indrim uh, Foundation or the CFMF, uh, CSPC, there are lots of foundations working. And those foundations have been helping in uh, supporting the community creating awareness, providing services, uh, and these services have, be, have been helping them in maintaining kind of waste management or water purification. Like this is just an example that I'm showing here that uh, uh, Panchayati Raj Institute, they have been maintaining the water ATMs through the support of different NGOs. The government has not been silent on drinking water. They have promoted lots of schemes and uh, like the Jal Jeevan mission uh, and experts are all here and the Basuda scheme or the PhD. There are lots of schemes on that. And uh, particularly when it comes to the government awareness on uh, the water quality and the impact, contaminated area, I should say. Coming on that, there are also different uh, programs on that. There are sometimes painting uh, the what Sundar has also shown, they are, have painted red color, coloring of the text. That's one of the measures that they are taking. And sometimes they are like, uh, they have gone for opening 
testing laboratories or providing kits. But then in all of these measures, the government have also find out some defects. Uh, they, they find it hard to uh, create awareness. This is a challenges that they have mentioned. And besides that, it's hard to get a timely monitoring because of the institutional setup. So maybe that is the sphere that we can look a little bit more. So on another one that is on animal husbandry, the findings we have was like, uh, before going to the findings, let me narrate a story where it, it shows that it has an impact on an uh, impact on livelihood. There were, it's a village in MP uh, and this particular village, two to three years ago, the whole village, the cattle in the whole village was sick. And uh, the, re like, the reason was water, contaminated water. And in that uh, pandemic, 15% of the animals died. And then people are like, they don't want to take risk. So from next time on, they reduce the cattle rearing. And that, uh, from continuing with that, slowly they reduce the cattle uh, rearing and then uh, they shift to another means of livelihood. So that was one another story. And what we have found out that people are like, so, uh, you know, careless or I should say, I, I'm not able to catch the exact word, enlighten me if I'm wrong, but then people are so uh, skeptical, like they don't think twice before like animals are died, they don't mind throwing away because for humans, we at least care of dumping, uh, of putting it, burying it. But then for animals in certain villages, they, send, they just dump in open areas, like if, even near to the places where the cows are grazing. So in the open areas also they are uh, dumping. From the personal level the or the household level, the, uh, the people are like, uh, sometimes they are, and they know that the water quality or the grasses that are available are not uh, that uh, nutritious or it's contaminated. So what they do is that uh, they go to, uh, they tie the animals, but it's kind of restriction. Uh, they tie the animals and then uh, sometimes they may have a separate trough. And there may be, uh, like I saw one, uh, uh, there was one separate well for animals uh, where there is gosala, they keep separate well for animals. From the government side related to animals, as soon as this presentation has already mentioned, like there is less emphasis given to the animals uh, or to the animal husbandry. And I think I agree with that because when we Google, I like many of you are already aware of water quality. So you might have found out, but as far as I could find, I, when I look, I couldn't find any details of the uh, regulations or any kind of uh, like governmental schemes related to water dr drinking water for animals. And most of the animals in India, one, uh, one this is the major point that I want to bring up is that most of the animals, few when they have few, they tie it. But when it is in a large herd, they usually take out in, for open grazing. When it's open grazing, that, uh, we are not sure what kind of water they are going to consume, what kind of fodder they are going to consume. So we need to think about monitoring the land management practices and be establishing pastures so that we can provide more nutritious uh, forages. Coming over to the fishery side, I'm jumping uh, quickly. <laughs> so coming to the fishery side, uh, from our analysis, we found out that from, I mean, from our responses, we found out that 35, 31% of them are using wastewater. They are using wastewater. And because of that, there is a uh, dying of the fishes. And uh, there is a kind of controversy because to a, uh, to a community where we considered, uh, where we considered fish as a secret or like pure form of food we would never go for wastewater use it because we it is for our own consumption in my community uh meat is not considered vegetarian but uh fish is considered vegetarian because my ancestors think that it is a pure form it lives in fresh water and it's good for our health so we consider so for a such community nobody would go for wastewater using in their fish but for commercial purpose where people don't consume fish for them it's fine 
So the controversy rises here, whether we should use or not, because the lab results say something else. There are also precautionary measures related to, like when there is by default wastewater, how should they man manage it? Then the, uh, the people have gone for lining and then occasional changing of water, which occasional changing of water, which I find it little expensive uh, precautionary measures, but maybe if it is impacting a lot on the livelihood, we can think over this topic. So coming to the agriculture side, what were our findings? Yeah, the studies we conducted mostly were in the places where there were uh, geogenic contamination, not the other rural, uh, urban uh, west part. But then contaminants, uh, we are not sure, even though we have lots of problems uh, that leads to uh, reduction in return, the contaminants in the food, uh, food change or the, we can uh, use the term biomagnification, could exist. But, but we have less information on the biomagnification uh, of the contaminated water. The other point on the alternative solutions that the people have taken up is that there are lots of alternative solutions. They have gone for alternative water supply, taking in extra water, land, uh, land fellow, keeping the land fellow. But then that comes with an expense they are putting an additional uh, cost of cultivation to that. And those is another topic to be decided, to be talked upon, and we can have a long debate on that. And on from the government side, the government has been, uh, like as compared to the animal side, their little bit of work is that because they have gone for surface water, supply of surface water. But how long will it take? Or what kind of effort do we need to reach the last mile? And that's the question that rises here. Uh, but then, uh, coming back to one point, I would not say that all wastewater is uh, bad, because Alkamem is also going to talk on the wastewater in agriculture. Right? Uh, so she will give a more detailed information on it. But then I would say that there are certain categories of wastewater that can be used, and we need to look at that. So these are some statistics, I won't go in detail. So the impacts, overall impact, this is what we have seen from, uh, uh, from our survey that many people were saying drinking water should be considered more or uh, the agriculture, the animal husbandry, and then the fishery. But as I, uh, from my side, when asked the conclusion, I would say, it depends on the priority of the people. You cannot say that you have to work on animal husbandry when their priority is in agriculture. Or you cannot say that uh, in West Bengal, if you go where there is fishery, you cannot say to the people that you have to go for a pure, uh, you cannot make a policy just for agriculture while the preference is fishery. So you should need, we need to look, look for a critical mapping and the priority of the people. So this is just, uh, very early stage of research. And uh, I would say a budding research where the discussion and the brainstorming in this room today will act like a fruiting hormone, which can bear fruits at the end. And looking forward to the, uh, like what responses do you have regarding these questions? We would really love to hear. And maybe after the field insights and the presentation on uh, wastewater in agriculture, we can uh, do a bit of exercise on the Mentimeter. Thank you. That's all. Yes. Uh, 
the screen share. We have to go back to this one. Okay. I think I can use this. No idea of that. So, till the study started, I never thought that water quality is important for anybody else apart from humans. It was so narrow minded. Whenever we talk about quality, we were just thinking, is it clear? My voice is clear. Um, so it was just thinking about fluoride, how it affects the humans, what is the water quality, what is the bacterial contamination, how many mortality, mort morbidity. So this was such a narrow-minded approach. So when we started this study, then even though it's a very small study and the interaction between the farmers, the interaction with the veterinary doctors, the interaction with the other NGOs in the study has really opened up how it is important and what is really happening overall for the water bodies and to the <clears throat> livestock. Uh, so this is exclusively my experience or our experience with our um, local CSOs, which we have done the study. So Nalgonda, the name Nalgonda is Nalagonda, that is the black stone. So you can see this beautiful boulders everywhere in Nalgonda. And basically it's a semi-arid uh, region, not much of a waterfall. And all of you know very well, I'm sure that it is well known for the fluoride content and water contamination of fluoride. So we looked at uh, livestock, agriculture, fisheries, and health part of it. The health component, I'll really tell you the interesting part of it. <clears throat> so impact on the li uh, livestock. So there is one, uh, two villages where the industries have started around 10 years back. So slowly the groundwater start contaminated. The visibility when you take the water from the where where well, it is literally a black in color. Anybody can see that uh, water quality black in color. And when you smell that water, it is chemical, and you can smell the water chemically. So nobody touches that water. Luckily, government is supplying Mission Bhagiratha water, that is the fresh water, which is from from uh, River Ganga, uh, sorry, River Godavari. But apart from that, any source from the, in that village, either the borewell water or surface water, it smells of chemical. And villagers, uh, especially the farmers, if they use the water to wash their face in summers from their uh, borewell, the skin burns. So nobody touches the water. Still, the cultivation is going. I'll talk about the uh, agriculture part of it in the next slide also. So we spoke about the cattle health. So the cattle health, everybody knows that the livestock is lifespan is coming down at least by five to six years. The milk production is coming down. And many talk, many of them talk about reproductive health. They buy new cows or new buffaloes, but they are not conceiving. So in this regard, we spoke to the veterinary doctor there. He also says that, yes, because of this industry, the water is polluted, water is the problem, but we don't have any solution as such. So uh, these are the basic issues we have seen that there is less amount of milk production, uh, cattle is not conceiving properly, and also the lifespan is coming down. And in case of goats, the weight gain in the goats are much lesser in comparison to the other areas. So in the market, they are getting lesser price for the same amount of effort and same amount of the number of the goats in other villages are getting. So this is about uh, cattle health. In the agriculture, there is a change crop pattern. And also human health, a lot of skin problems are there. And coming to the agriculture, typically, the agriculture crop cultivation is in the form of paddy, now slowly shifting to cotton. So previously, the 
common crops in Algonda, in Telangana, especially in Nalgonda, are more of pulses, millets, castor. Uh, these crops are being replaced with two major crops. One is cotton, the other one is paddy. And <clears throat> especially this, along with our um, study uh, group, where we uh, conducted a study here, there are adjacent fields of the same farmer. One field he irrigated with the canal water, the other field he irrigates with the bore water. So the bore water uh, paddy uh, gets that crop gets 10 to 15 quintals on a lesser side. It's just as they said, adjacent. So when we went and tested uh, the water quality there, the water is high in chloride content, it is high in nitrate content. So we are not really sure that whether it is causing. Otherwise, is there any difference between the bore water, which is coming from the groundwater, is less uh, yielding, or the, uh, the surface water produces more yield? I'm not really sure is there any difference or not. But this is our observation. Because there was a request from the farmer, he said that there is a difference between this yield. So he requested us to test it, and when we test it, this is the uh, this is what we found. Apart from that, we also spoke to the agriculture executive officer. So just to find out whether there is any change in the crop pattern, whether the amount of agriculture rank which is being cultivated is reduced or increased. So in two villages where these industries are there, there are. 3,200 acres of land was under cultivation. In four years back, now it has come down to 980 acres. So these are the uh, figures which are given by AEO. There is another uh, two villages where 3,800 acres of land was cultivated. Now the cultivation has come to 1,200 uh, acres. So what is really happening? Uh, is it not really, agriculture is not really income generating, not supporting the livelihood. They, that's why they are leaving the agriculture. Otherwise, the real estate values are so high, they are not really interested to do the agriculture. They want to sell their land and then you know, make money. Again, these are observations which needs in-depth study about it. So here, Pochampali weave, it is something like ikat weaving where they create a design in the yarn itself and then they weave it. So till two, uh, 2014, there was no drainage system in that village. There were soap pits in, the, in their own houses. So this dyed water was put into the soap pits. In 2014, the drainage system, open drainage system has been planned and executed and from that time onwards, the dye is directly thrown into the open drainage. So the bowl, uh, soap pits are not being used. So this water is reaching the uh, pond nearby and fisheries is getting affected. Especially we tested the pH, the pH has come to 9. So the 9, whenever the higher pH, the denaturing of the cellular uh, skin cell, uh, cellular activity goes on, so this decreases the shelf life of the fish. So thereby, these people cannot really go far to sell the fish. They have to depend on the local market. They may not be able to get a better price. So uh, this is another thing um, which we observe. And this is uh, emerging problems, the uranium, which Sundar was also mentioning about. So there are five villages we just observed. In this five villages, these are the tribal area, uh, very far away. The health services are also not really uh, easily uh, approachable because either they have to walk six to eight kilometers, otherwise they have to use a bike in that very rough uh, roads. <clears throat> the major health concern is kidney problems there. So can you guess that what could be the number of kidney problems problems when I say that major health uh, risk or the major health diseases they are suffering with kidney diseases. Can you just give a rough uh, percentage or the numbers in a thousand population? Anybody? Rough? Yes. Eight percent. According to WHO, any, anything more than 20 percent 
should be considered as a public health problem, right? So a 780 uh, population, there are around 100 kidney-related issues. Again, this data is coming from Asha worker, from the angan body. So they are not clear whether there is a kidney stones or a real kidney disease as such, but around 100 people are suffering. So in all these five villages, the population is around 1,000 to 1,500, but the number of kidney problems are around 100 to 200 people are suffering with kidney problems. And migration is one of the major issues uh, in this uh, village. I feel that it's good they are doing. Yeah. Um, so we also observed that there is an interconnected influences, right? For example, the policies to promote rice stopped, uh, you know, and minimum price, uh, minimum, what do you call? Uh, uh, minimum support price, yeah. So that uh, totally people stopped uh, cultivating millets, change in the crop pattern, untreated water disposal, and industries in the form of development, we are creating industries, well accepted, but at the same time, where we are constructing this, and regulations are not being implemented, and maybe the climate change we have not really studied. So that is resulting in going for the deeper aquifers, excess usage of fertilizers, and uh, boost into uh, weaving activity. All of them again contributing to the uh, groundwater contamination, surface water contamination, and dependency on the deeper aquifers. Again, that is resulting in less yield, change in the crop pattern, less cultivated land, less income, less distance, uh, long distances per po posture, all of them leading to challenge to the livelihood and also migration is one of the major issues and major health complications are going to be there because relate the emerging contaminants and the health relation we have not yet really uh, well equipped to deal with it so um, this is what the study found out so the solutions also uh, yeah the government one is that Mission Gaktiya has been implemented by the government to regenerate the lakes, which is 30% success wherever it has happened. People said that there is an increased groundwater level, increased cultivated land, and uh, grazing part also for the cattle has been increased. And some of the NGOs are working on uh, few initiatives are wet and dry cultivations, testing water quality, creating awareness to use soap pets, and communities, surprisingly, communities talk about the problems, but they are not really very response, uh, no much response, maybe because the awareness of the interlinkages between water quality and problems are not really good. In all the villages, we have seen only one individual has taken the initiative where he constructed a tank for the cattle to provide the water. So uh, I feel that to create a water safe community, we need to come together so then only we can able to see the problem and address the problems. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you, Tulita, for giving the time. And, uh, I think we should now get into the panel discussion so that you want to Yeah? Okay. So you want to, uh, let's say, we just send it to one ten or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alka had a presentation. So I think maybe Alka, we can. Probably we can keep it short. Maybe you can just speak with the slides. And I think she had prepared for a much longer time, right? 20 yeah. minutes or so. I know. Yeah. <laughs> we are getting compressed. I think we started half an hour late. So. I will be skipping the slides very fast. So bear with me. You get one slide. 
अभी आफ्टर द सेशन नहीं 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 सॉरी ये बोला एग्रीकल्चर्ड फैक्ट so the first challenge is that fresh water is reduced for irrigation in that case uh, waste water in many places is taking over replacing fresh water used for irrigation so that's the first scenario second challenge is though it is being used 70% of waste water is untreated and left into water bodies contaminating water bodies uh, this we are accepting it's established <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh, this is a case of uh, rajput uh, where you know despite uh, many incentives and policies and scheme from the municipality and the state government to use waste water for other uses but it was really failing in many ways the municipality also was trying to reuse it there were incentives the infrastructure was given but the amount or the quantity which is being used for other uses you can see It's a very recent data. In municipal uses, zero point two MLD. That's all. There's two hundred and ten MLD was all for agriculture. And there is an additional benefit of using irrigation uh, wastewater for irrigation. That is the NP and PA value, uh, which is already there embedded in the wastewater. So okay, I'm skipping this. So this is an interesting slide. This is a snapshot of what is happening in Ahmedabad. <clears throat> total treatment capacity as claimed by amc is 1200 mld the total sewage received by these stps is 1000 mld actual sewage treated is 920 mld sewage bypassed from stps is 160 mld each of the stp in all the cities have a bypass line for maintenance of stp or whatever other reasons and this phenomena is not only for maintenance it's a regular thing every day there would be bypassing so total untreated sewage from amdabad is 160 plus 600 although sewage generation is 1600 actual generation of sewage is that much so really you know so much is untreated okay yeah what Six one three. Where did the six one three come? One two five two minus. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. One two five two minus nine. One six nine three minus uh, uh, nine twenty. So the total sewage generation is a barren. Yes. Data point with which you are doing the. Sum. The minus nine twenty. So it will come six one three. Okay. Total cities in India are four thousand cities. Uh, I'm leaving this. Out of that, forty uh, years ago, the sewage generated by cities was seventy-three, which which could serve uh, uh, as irrigation water was seventy-three thousand hectares. Now, uh, if you look at the cities which are sewered, because collection of wastewater is a precondition for its use as irrigation, so one hundred and seventy-five cities are collecting wastewater through sewage collection systems. so in that 175 cities wastewater irrigation can be planned in a effective way uh, there were field studies which i have done uh, jammu and kashmir punjab gujarat maharashtra karnataka and tamil nadu 
an area in acreage where irrigation is happening is this. I'm not reading it out. Uh, the only place, the only state where it is happening formally, and this data in this data is Punjab, where all the irrigation uses are formal, give, done by um, done by irrigation department, not irrigation department, soil and water conservation department. Although this is happening, public health and soil water quality concerns are huge, many of which Sundar has talked already. But there is sanitation safety plan, uh, which describes that how can you reduce the risk of using wastewater. There is a way given in the sanitation safety plan, which is a publication of WHO and Vishwanath was part of it. Uh, we have modified that to look at the sanitation safety as a uh, as told by the farmers, as narrated by the farmers only, that whether they find it risky or not. This method I'm not describing again. Okay, there are some safe practices of using wastewater by farmers themselves. So they channel the wastewater, then they put it in the natural drains, then in a settling tank, then it's pumped into furrows, let it settle, and from furrows they apply it. So in this process, it's naturally treated and remain, becomes safe for irrigation. The other things which farmers do is they sometimes use gloves and gumboots for uh, doing irrigation. Uh, there is a tendency of wastewater when it is flowing in a river body to get clean on its own. There is a tendency, and I have documented this. This is the way wastewater flows in at the back, and the water points where it is collected, and the way water falls. Okay, heavy metal, industrial contaminants, already covered. This is also I'm leaving. Just showing. Emerging contaminants, forever chemicals. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so did you know any this coming you know, during the discussion? In the speech? Sorry, I mean, we are, we are I think, running late from all sides. From the beginning, like that, chai pakoda, you know, and then with lunch also coming. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, Anush. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Let's get into the. Uh, so we have uh, Vishwanath, uh, Nafisa Ben. I think all three of them will be much just... productive in this talk. So I would invite all three of you to take a seat. Uh, uh, Sundar is going to be the moderator. Yes, sure. yeah. Can we use the mic? The mic here yeah, for. Uh, so, why is there video? Slide, huh? Thank you. Video, video, video. Okay. Um, uh, 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 apologies to Joey, um, potential presenters they are genuinely present. Kia be. In a rapid time you know, for everybody. Um, but yeah, let us, we have time now for all of us to come. Um, and then thanks to Nafisa Ben, Eklubia, and Vishwanath. Um, uh, as shared, you know, this is a wide exploration, and now you have a little bit flavor you know, of uh, what we, you know, some of us have observed or worked on. Today. Um, start with Nafisa bin. Nafisa bin, we know of your work in Uthan and you know, work on uh, women and water conservation and with decades of experience. And what are you seeing today 
uh, with all of that and it will be interesting to hear from you about how you are reflecting you know on what we are uh, talking about over here i think mainly from um, i think the conversations also that you have been sharing with all of us in terms of your experience and how is it changing over the years Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Closer to you. So uh, thank you so much, uh, really, for inviting me and uh, uh, I mean, giving me the space also. Uh, as what you were saying, that uh, Ushan's experience has been for more than 40 years. Uh, gradually, we are the one who actually told us that water is an issue. So, and this is what I've been hearing since 40 years. So whether it is, a, it is about salinity, it's about equity, it's about a lot of things. I mean, like technologies and things. Just coming to especially the water quality and the, the sessions which are there, um, I, will, I will just give a, a small just story, which is not, should not be seen as just an anecdote, but it is something which is reflective of what is happening right now in Gujarat or maybe elsewhere also, and I think we heard that. Uh, Uthan has been working in coastal area for a long time. So there were areas where there was huge water problem, availability of water problem, I mean, like quantity of water, right? Um, uh, I mean, quality, meteorological quality, and those things were there. And, you know, they say, you okay, create awareness and they will change. And so that is one part of it. Now, in this area, I'm talking about from Bhavnagar to Nongwa, where Uttan has been working, and where the community, especially the women's groups, you know, they uh, came together and with the help of government and all, there are a lot of water bodies which have been created in this area. To the extent that this area, where once upon a time people used to migrate out, they started coming in and settling because there was so much of water and then the whole economy was changing. And now, and also our, uh, I mean, some of our women farmers, uh, because when we talk about the farmers, we very much keep women farmers in mind. Of course, men farmers are also there. They have been taking up on a large scale organic farm. Now, what they're saying, I was just there a month back, and, you know, and, and I mean, uh, continuously we've been getting this uh, kind of complaints. What has happened is that in that area, a uh, lot of these factories which have come up. So at one level, there are this lignite mining. Now, because of lignite mining, people are scared. They don't know what is happening. You know, what is happening underground? Because there are huge heaps of uh, mud which is thrown. And they don't know what is happening to their cake. They don't know what is happening to the water bodies, you know, which they have. Plus, there are these factories around these villages where, uh, because their land has been taken away and all that. And they release water. Now, these are huge water bodies which were created by communities for the survival. I mean, this is what we're talking about with drinking waters, uh, you know, security or livelihood security. And this was really there were good fresh water bodies, and they just go and at night they release uh, they dump the uh, wastewater from their uh, factories. I mean, I didn't bring this uh, you know, photographs and slides and all that, but we do this. And so they're saying that at one level we are talking about doing organic farming and you know water security. So water security means availability of water at any time at my doorstep. But good quality water. I mean that even now people themselves are very conscious about that. Yes, they need to have good quality. And they're saying, okay, we have done everything what we were supposed to do as communities, you know, as women, I mean leaders and everything. And now there is nobody to protect that water because government is not taking any stand on this. You know, the communities are, you know, where they are complaining. There are lots of fights, there is a lot of corruption. So women are saying, what is the answer to this? We have done whatever we were supposed to, to secure our uh, water and we, you know, uh, water security villages, like we're quite sufficient. Uh, we had so much of water and like we could. And today 
I mean, they're they're in such a condition and getting more and more into it. They see the only source, you know, they're becoming dependent is jal jeevan mission, which they didn't want to because jal jeevan mission, the water that they're getting, that they've been hearing stories about everywhere that you know it comes one day, it doesn't come second day, it doesn't come third day, it comes for some time, you know, all this kind of thing. So, which means that they're saying that. We may just have to leave this place. So imagine those people uh, earlier used to migrate. They came, I mean, they, they started like their whole economy of change. And now, again, because of water contamination and uh, what is happening, how this, uh, you know, this whole uh, contaminated water gets into their food chain. And they're saying that, so we are neither this way or not that way. I mean, I'm not, kya bane, I'm not organic farming person. Organic farming. We are doing organic farming, but the water doesn't allow us to do that, and which is coming from there, and, and there is no protection. So, what is the, so the question is that I'm, I, I mean, I, I don't think I have a solution. I think that I'm, I'm bringing this question from those women from the community as to where is the answer? Are the answers in the policies? Yeah, policies are saying that the water should be. No, I mean, should not be contaminated by the uh, industry and all that. Who's to protect that one? And when when they go to protect it, then what happens? They put either behind the bars or they are beaten up. You know. So what is the solution to this? I mean, so I'm sorry, but I'm I'm really more question rather than any answer. You know, because to me, awareness and all that we've done a lot. I mean, lot of awareness, more awareness is there in communities. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that we don't need that uh, uh, continued humanity, but this whole thing is blatant. I mean, blatantly just spoiling, taking away their resources, land being taken away, water being contaminated. What do they do? So I just end that with uh, my uh, say because about technologies and all that and alternatives and all that one can talk. I mean, we've got a huge experience with the communities in terms of what different alternate alternatives and how do you do gender sensitive management? So, you know, we are talking about equitable distribution of water, sustainability, all these things are there. You know, uh, you know, Pond came to Bath, like what Thans experience goes back, 40 years back, when we started in Salai area, and the community said, Due to Salai area, we'll do lining of the pond and harvesting. And that was a kind of a innovative idea which was. Uh, and then, uh, you know, roof water tank and subsurface check them to prevent seawater up into the. So, so many alternatives are there, but then what, what do you do with that water? water, water? It's the question. So, I think so many questions that you have raised and put forward, right? Especially what uh, the women ask you, the women's groups, about what more can we do after doing so much for. In a few decades, and, and I think those questions are important, and it's uh, that's also the purpose here. So so I, think, I think the question is, what is it that we as a community can do here, and what is it that the government is doing? Or, because what government is not doing, is it something that this community can do? So there is a so there is a wider responsibility. Right? So there is a wider responsibility, and <clears throat> I think we need to. That's the reason we need to start talking about it. Uh, so uh, going to Ekalavya, Ekalavya, a very interesting conversation that we had, and we started uh, talking about this session. And um, um, so I just leave it to you in terms of your reflection now that we are here and what comes to you. Yeah. Again, all giving this opportunity. Um, I will be answering this question from a very specific lens, and the lens is uh, of the flood prone areas. And when I say the flood prone areas, basically in Dupi, Bihar, Bengal, and Assam, and the other uh, northeastern states. You see, uh, during floods, and in fact, post floods, the habitations they tend to depend a lot on livestock for the survival. I mean, that is the immediate uh, check that they have, which they can, you know, uh, use um, for additional 
resources which they require to preserve themselves, and the other being migration. But this is something which is insecure. Now, when uh, Sundar reached out and we had that conversation, I, I kept on thinking that, you know, how, how do I locate this entire thought process in, in this landscape? And I, given an opportunity, I always grab it with all my hands to articulate what is actually happening in the platform. Now, the fact is that if this is a bankable check which is being used and if those resources themselves are exposed to water which is contaminated and mining, if we are talking about contamination which is geogenic and anthropogenic. Sense during floods, it's largely created by us in terms of the water that the livestock uh, is being exposed to, and thereafter could be geogenic and anthropogenic. So it is dreadful, and I think this is an idea which was coming in to actually see because uh, some we, we were told by the young researcher that you know this is a this is a thought in its nascent stage. Now, how do we take this entire issue forward? I think it will be good to see the level of exposure in, say, for instance, uh, disaster vulnerable areas. Not only the floods, but also the others across the country. Because somehow I feel uh, access to safe water or access to uh, contaminated water depends a lot in the kind of profile the state has or, or the region has. So that is one thought which came to my mind. And uh, somehow we, we have been observing whether be it starting from floods of 2007 to the floods of 2024 uh, that this impact goes unrecognized and it is awarded to none and I don't know whether people are also able to bring out this connection because when we started work in Bihar in 2005 it was very difficult to get people to articulate that flood water is dangerous for consumption or even getting water from the hand pumps, which was provided by the external health agencies in Bihar by digging in uh, uh, hand pumps on the embankments, that those that was also providing you the, the unsafe water. But then this link of unsafe water, consumption of unsafe water having an impact on human beings way back in 2005 was very difficult to establish. I don't know. This is a big challenge in terms of how do we make them realize or how do we understand their expression of the connection between consuming dirty, I mean, you know, contaminated water and the impact of human beings. So that's, that's one point which I really would like to bring on the table. The second was also about this whole divide between rural, peri-urban, and urban. What exactly is the status? Because status of, say again, I'm coming back to livestock because that, wherever we are, they are kind of a support mechanism for the households who are, you know, depending on this kind of uh, like, uh, you know, economic backup facility. So, uh, just just wanted to flag these two ideas, maybe later. Thanks, Eklavia. And also, <clears throat> this the point that you made that livestock is all around us, you know, that animals are all around us, and huge support system, you know, to people. And that's why these questions are also important. Uh, Vishwanath, uh, sorry, we could not have a conversation before, uh, before this session you know, to have a context for this, but the broader uh, thought behind many of these issues which are coming here, wastewater and also looking at wastewater and nutrients and all that we've been getting through so many years. So there are so many other layers you know, to it in terms of how farmers see, but how do you look at uh, what is put forward here in terms of livelihoods and what is being spoken about and the questions that we are that are being raised, how ready are we to even you know, talk about it? You know, I mean, what is the readiness to even talk about any of these issues. Yeah. So thanks uh, for this uh, for the discussion with the excellent introductions by everybody about the issue and the concentration. So Sudar, I'd like to draw the attention of the audience. You know 
that there is the concept of one health which is being talked about. One health is talking about human health, animal health, and environment, health, all three together. And at the center of it becomes one health. So I think the framing that you did addressed all three issues environmental health, in terms of the pollution, quality, geogenic anthropogenic, animal health, which is what we're focusing on livestock, but also wild animals. So there is the biodiversity of it, and then human health, which is all together. Now, that narrative is unfortunately so far being driven by the, uh, the medical threatening. And to some extent, the veterinary science fraternity, I think that the space that we find should come from the lens of where we come from, from the water and other sectors that are there, and we should become part of that conversation. So, the framing around one health would be a good way to address all issues. Right? And they're also grappling as to what it actually means. It's a darkness to it. The second point uh, that I think is valid is what is the unit of intervention that we conceptualize, even in understanding, uh, first understanding, then possibly institutionally framing it as giving responsibility, accountability, and training, and then the action on the ground to, to, to work on it. Right? So, as uh, was being pointed out in a particular case in Bangal, uh, there's a particular issue for local issues like large growth, which is a particular issue. So the thing with water and I think with one health is it's both local and global at the same time. The actionable component of it is local to a large extent, but it has to be informed by global currents. So if industrial pollution is coming from a city to a rural area, obviously the one health will have to chart watersheds and cross watershed boundaries. So typologies, floodplains at a broader scale, but Units of intervention at low risk. And then the unit of intervention is also not necessarily as we found with the watershed or water sector, uh, just the unit of hydrology or aquifer. Right? It's also the unit of administration. So, where do we think that uh, this conversation and this intervention will be the most strong experience? I think that the Jal Jeevan mission provides a good intervention point. What it says is 55 meters per capita per day minimum. Most states, at least my state, has bought it as maximum under the scientific team for 55 and 60. It is possible that many of the judgment emission schemes can start to become inclusive for livestock requirements. So, a cow, for example, in my state requires a minimum of 60 liters per water. But a cow is the most remunerative component of the family's income, right? That's, and so, water for the cow has a greater chance for it being paid to the ground panchayat water fees than just consumption at household. So Jal Jeevan Mission also is looking for putting a meter, and at some point in time it imagines cost recoveries to come. And I think the, the discussion in Jal Jeevan Mission will occur later, but one of the big challenges of Jal Jeevan Mission is the financial sustainability of the scheme, apart from the environmental sustainability component of it. Right? So these are two are challenges. But I think in the framing of those challenges, I think we, we can do a lot of advocacy to push JJM to look at livestock needs. <laughs> then, within that, uh, the third point that uh, I talk about from an intervention perspective is when we work in the villages of rural Karnataka, in semi epic Karnataka, uh, tank 300, the, the mission bagger that was mentioned in uh, Telangana and Andhra Pradesh also has a problem. The tanks being raised, which are being rehabilitated. And now there's a lot of discussion around how do we generate equity and access for the water supply tank. Joy is a great proponent of uh, one of the great proponents of it. Uh, what you do is that if a tank is rehabilitated, it only benefits those who own land. Uh, for the landless, it doesn't mean anything. But the intermediaries who own livestock, for example, sheep and goat, which is small dominant, which are generally owned by the Dalit community and the border communities, can have a stay in the tank works if there's a dialogue in the rehabilitation, which includes them right from the beginning. So, therefore, you're making sure that water quality and grazing quality both can be included as part of the water region. And a back of the generation. That's something that we can uh, think of. The other uh, point that Alka made was of the sanitation system, which she briefly touched upon it. I think um, we need to move towards a risk based approach rather than a standards based approach. Your presentation focused a lot on standards. And the standards can be a debatable issue. In the Indian context, we'll have to look at how we go up to reach those standards. So, therefore, the ladder. With the standards, we'll start with the risk-based approach, which is the sanitation safety plan. And what to say if you plan for livestock, right? Of which we which we frame ourselves. And uh, lastly, 
one of the critical attentions that we have to look for is in terms of the use of pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, pesticides, glyphosate, on our land, it is increasingly being seen as being some fodder. So when Balkhakos and I go to fields where wastewater is being used, you see packets of pesticides, herbicides, pesticides, and people are only obsessed about the quality of wastewater which is being applied, uh, applied whereas the other lot is legal and uncontrolled, right? So what is causing the harm, the lack of productivity of the rice paddy which is in your border water? Is it just the border water or is it a package of practices which is impacting on it? And what then is the impact of that package of practices? Redesigned surfaces flowing away and reaching the water bodies and then impacting fish, right? So wastewater for growing fish may be bad psychologically and even the source of it. But is pesticide reaching the, uh, the water body pure, not pure, because it's invisible, and how does it impact uh, fish? And I think finally, the Indian way has to be found. The Indian way for me is that in terms of the development model that we have, the Kulbinska formula, formulation of things, where we are at a particular per capita income, different areas having different per capita incomes. We need to find solutions which are appropriate to that investment potential of that community and the local economy. Right? So that is the thing that we do find in there the boundaries of one. That's thank you so much, Vishwan. And uh, I think we have some language to talk about here in terms of one health is the whole world waiting itself. Uh, and thanks, Vishwan, for bringing in because there's already all of these interconnections. Uh, secondly, as you're trying to say that it's so contextual and so rich locally that generalizations might sometimes end up hurting very right? so many different needs and stakes. Uh, very interesting point from all three of them, and I'm sure that there are more questions in your mind and more things to share. Um, I think we have 30 more minutes, right? Mm -hmm. So can we just move around and touch this mic here and Nidhi gets yeah. Well, thank you so much and I'm glad that uh, others uh, were wanting me to speak. So um, a lot has already been said and you know when I was reached out, uh, the crux of the conversation as I understood was how uh, do we build water resilient communities? And uh, amidst that, how do we tackle the issue of water security? Oh, sorry, water quality. But before we get there, you know, I have to, uh, the organization that I represent is basically a grassroots interventionist organization. This is how we identify ourselves. And uh, amidst implementation, I uh, have to flag a very color neutral um, aspect that uh, not a green, not a red flag, but I'm a gentilist because I do um, development research. And from a researcher's perspective, I'd say that before we actually go in and tackle the issue of water quality, we have to look in, at this entire uh, ecosystem, uh, you know, from a systemic perspective where communities like uh, the one in uh, Haryana, you know, uh, several of you would know about Mewat, which was very recently, uh, not very recently, but was rechristened as Nu, was identified as one of the most backward districts of India when the Aspiration Districts program was launched. And I can confidently say that water quality, is, uh, more than 70% of new uh, is saline. The groundwater is saline and there's no other water source. So in such a context, water quality comes secondary. Water access is the primary concern. And when communities grapple with water access, water quality doesn't matter. Right. So I believe that when we are talking about water quality and building water resilient communities, we also have to uh, see it from a systemic perspective. We have to take an ecosystem approach and see that, uh, you know, communities for whom the primary concern is water access, how would they get onto water quality? That's absolutely secondary. They can see, uh, 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 you know, uh, fluorosis is widespread. They can see uh, dental fluorosis is absolutely rampant in that district in several other zones where we work but uh, they are witness to it they are victims to it but they do nothing because that they have no choice right so we have to see that water quality can only be tackled if water access is taken care of of course gentleman mission is trying to do that but 
what happens to water treatment at the point of use. Uh, the second point that I plan to make here very briefly uh, in the interest of time is that when we look at anything related to water at the domestic level, we have to remember that women are the forebearers of domestic water management. And so anything that we do, any action we take, any discussion we do, we have to do it from a gender transformative lens and not just isolate saying that, you know, okay, women are the forebearers of water, domestic water management, so let's go target women. No, it doesn't happen like that. The choice of treating water, even at the individual level, is not solely hers. We have to remember that there are costs involved, there are choices involved that are not totally hers. So we have to look at everything from a gender transformative lens, from an ecosystem lens, and not just isolate stakeholders and tackle uh, problems singularly. Thank you so much. Sorry. Uh, uh, so, uh, so the formulation that you made about looking at safe water beyond human, I think it's a very important uh, point in the context of rural livelihoods. But I think we are, we need to, not that we are not, we need to focus on production systems in the multiplicity it exists. There is a market oriented production system, there is subsistence, and there are the commons. Now, when you look at producers who have already seen or experienced value in production, be it milk animals, be it fisheries, you already see consciousness and action about what quality. This I've seen across Odisha in, in Sambalpur, where milk is a product, where in fisheries, they are already diverting fresh water for production. And to me, the issue is the larger equity issue around one diversion of uh, uh, finite freshwater resources away from primary purposes of consumption to production, you are depriving already disadvantaged people further. And within the pre-production systems, the market production system is getting resilience. There is very little around subsistence and there is no concern for common. So that is why, in fact, uh, in some of the parts of Orissa, uh, uh, where there is a bit of a caste hierarchy clearly visible, you will find that the poorest sections, water bodies, are the ones where the wastewater is diluted. So they do not have such. Whereas the better of people, they will they, their production systems are to be there. So recognizing the value of production system when it comes to what the whole safe water conversation, I think is a is a very critical point. Otherwise, and from a research point of view for ITP, I think bringing in this equity element as a research lens. Would be very important. Otherwise, we will we will end up privileging research that is for the more privileged object. Uh, the share yes. So we we basically work in urban areas, in Antarctic city, and we now looking at healthier water rather than safe water. So we have changed the whole thinking pattern a little bit. And then all these problems, you know, these are brilliant discussions what you're talking about. This is really eye-openers. And we say in three walks, So we said we taught people to have toxin-free living. So we said in your home, you use a shampoo or a heartbreak or whatever. You are actually contaminating the drainage, and the drainage is contaminating the river. So, can you start using Arita? So, we have started promoting people to use Arita. So, a lot of people are shifting to Arita, a lot of people are shifting to bioenzymes. We started saying, can your gardens be toxin free? So, we talked about weedicide, what weedicide does. We talked about all the pesticides, how they are. Half shelf life is 84 days. So if you spray it on Pindi, even after digestion and flushing it down the toilet, it's still toxic for 84 days when it goes to the tree. So people have shifted out of toxicity. So people use absolutely natural solutions. And to make it happen more, we are planting 200 Arita trees in Ahmedabad every year. So someone told me one day here, Arita is very expensive. He said, natural things cannot be expensive. 
So we started planting trees, you know. So, so what I'm saying is that solutions can be built in into a lifestyle, into an understanding. And if we do that, probably this will happen. Like I, this land thing was very interesting that you said. I just checked it's only in Umbrelli. Because Gil has seven pedigian rivers which are formed with water seeping from the roots of the trees. So I said Gil cannot have contaminated water. So Gil doesn't have, it's the Umbrelli area where they're digging out water. So as soon as I go back, I'm reaching out to the forest officer. Because the forest, I see them digging water from underground within the forest and making a tank for lions to drink. So we can tell them, please, five months or two, nadi ka pani and then seven rivers come on, you know, you don't need those underground pumps. So what, what I'm just trying to say is that solutions. We all need to build solutions into our lifestyle. We need to campaign for solutions and we need to talk about them. So Ahmedabad, a lot of people are now collecting rainwater during monsoon to drink. So koi bola ki mere paas tanki nahi hai. Paise matka to bhar le. To 365 din nahi, to 20 din to And it was very nice that a lot of people started keeping those containers. Wo kapra baanthe the, char kone pe rassi baanthe. Beech mein patthar rakhte the, the water would flow into a container. And they would drink water for at least 20, 30 days. So I said, let's do a big day. Okay. So all these issues, you know, they are there, we you know. Like all this uh, cellular electricity was getting contaminated. He's saying, can we start making septic tanks? We don't have septic tanks to Kharkuas and Gargar toilet. We're so Kharkuas bana rahe, wo soap pits bana rahe. And there are no septic tanks to soap pits. So all the soap pits are actually contaminating the shallow aquifer, which our ancestors used for centuries. Kuhah bana ke paani pite de. Ab wo 20 foot wala paani pite de. So there are solutions which we need to talk about along with the problems. You know, give them solutions to the people. If we give solutions, I think people will koi nahi chata, koi bimar nahi hona chata If you give them solutions, they will adopt it. And I think this is just a little different point of view I thought I'd share. My name is Unis, I'm working with the Kakakas. So thanks for the work. Well, I think you have initiated with a very good in the initiative that is the part of quality index. So and it's good at the national level, we can draw some good maps on all the things. But I think there are, there's one, one of my experience that I'm working with a community in NASA. So we have done some FTK groups there. So logo ne pucha ki isse kya hoga? Water quality isse kya hoga? Hamne kaha monthly level pe jau aur kuch contaminants I think Iron के लिए अच्छा है तो डीडीएस उसका ऊपर है उसके लिए अच्छा है तो उसको जो पैथोलॉजिकल जो बैक्टीरियोलॉजिकल देयर then I think if we can bring this WQ the water quality index from higher unit to lower unit at the ground at the village level, then I think I think it's uh, we can connect with the people or there's a panchayat, it's called Pashtim Chayat uh, of Panchayat in Kamrup district. So, butter, we have developed a butter quality index there. Or, we have started this uh, in September 22. And the uh, Sari parameter is you know, critical, jo we have given the weightage to all the parameters. So, and we have covered our, uh, around 14 parameters. In September 22, it was in unsuitable category. And over the six, next six years, we have in excellent categories. So, this is 
तो मुझे लग रहा है कि वाटर क्वालिटी इंडेक्स इज द सोल्यूशन एक प्रोडक्ट है एंड प्रोडक्ट है बट उसके साथ में प्रोसेस जो है उसके साथ में जो अप्रोच है बीसीसी के अप्रोच के वहां पे लाइफ सपोज गांव में क्लोरिनेशन नहीं होता था तो क्लोरिनेशन का जो इंडिकेटर थे ऑलरेडी आपके इंडेक्स को वो नीचे ले आते थे अनसुटेबल कैटेगरी में लाते थे क्लोरिनेशन क्यों नहीं हो रहा था ब्लीचिंग पाउडर नहीं गांव में थी और किसी ने बात नहीं किया था उससे तो बी है कोऑर्डिनेटर विद द एसओ और पीएचडी डिपार्टमेंट उसके साथ में हमने बात किया ब्लीचिंग पाउडर पाउडर आया वहां पे पंप ऑपरेटर का ट्रेनिंग किया तो एक पैरामीटर आपका बेहतर चल रही सैंड फिल्टर था आयरन के लिए तीन साल से उसका सैंड चेंज भी हुआ था तो वी हैड उसका जो सैंड है उसकी लेयर है वो चेंज हुआ उसमें तो आपका इंडेक्स आयरन भी आपके स्टैंडर्ड में आ गया तो ओवर द सिक्स मंथ धीरे धीरे करके जो अनसुटेबल तो जितना भी ये स्टडी करने का प्रयास किया है और उन लोगों ने चार अलग अलग स्टेट्स में जो काम हुआ है उसको मॉनिटर किया है और उनके जिन साथियों ने सर्वे किया है उनके साथ पूरा बातचीत किया है तो ओवरऑल ये निकल के आया है क्योंकि कई चीजें सर्वे के लिए नहीं थी और उन चीजों को जाके एसेस करना अपने आप में बहुत टफ टास्क है इतना इजी नहीं है कि किसका कनेक्शन किसके साथ किस तरीके का है वाटर क्वालिटी का क्या एनिमल हजबेंडी के साथ कोई कनेक्शन है शायद ही सोचना भी मुश्किल था तो जो लोगों का रेस्पॉन्स है मैं जस्ट रेस्पॉन्स पे चारों टाइम बोलता हूँ कि ये सुनने में भी आया है कि ऐसा भी होता है कि है ना क्या ऐसा भी होता है क्या पानी खराब होगा तो क्या भैंस के दूध का वेट भी कुछ चेंज होता है क्या है ना और जब स्टडीज हुआ है तो काफी छोटी छोटी चीजों को ऑब्जर्व करने की कोशिश की है जिसमें कि फेड शब्द है एस एन एफ एक शब्द है तो बड़ा एक अजीब सा चीज ये था कि एस एन एफ को सिर्फ वो ही लोग जानते हैं जो अपना दूध डेयरी सेंटर्स पर देते हैं अदरवाइज तो एस एन एफ क्या है शायद नहीं होता है तो और फिर क्या उसमें चेंजेस कैसे होते हैं क्या पानी की क्वालिटी से कोई इफेक्ट होगा तो एक समराइज तो ये है कि कोई कनेक्शन नहीं बिठा ठीक है और मैं जस्ट सिचुएशन सबके सामने साथ शेयर करता हूँ कि वो क्या सिचुएशन थी एमपी के एक विलेज में हम लोग बैठे हैं और पूरा इंडस्ट्रियल बेल्ट है वहां जो इंडस्ट्रीज हैं वो लगभग चालीस साल से पहले से हैं जिस जगह पर है मैं ये सिचुएशन यहाँ क्यों शेयर कर रहा हूँ क्योंकि उसमें तीनों ही चीजें कवर हो रही है एनिमल हजबेंड्री भी बना है एग्रीकल्चर पैटर्न भी हो रहा है फिशरीज का भी एक पार्ट है और गवर्नमेंट का नजर भी है वहां स्टार्टिंग में फिशरीज से करता हूँ कि जो एक पॉन्ड है वो एक सिंगल पॉन्ड है और उसमें फाइव टू सिक्स मंथ उस पॉन्ड में पानी रहता है इंडस्ट्रियल वेस्ट का पूरा ड्रेनेज आ रहा है वो उस पॉन्ड में मिलता है ये सब होने के बाद भी गवर्नमेंट उस पॉन्ड के लिए फिशरीज का टेंडर करता है जो गवर्नमेंट टेंडर्स होते हैं वो फिशरीज का टेंडर करता है टेंडर के बाद में जो इफेक्ट लोगों ने बताया है वो कहते हैं कि वो अचानक से कुछ होता है इस टाइम पे किस तरीके का कंटेमिनेटेड पानी उसके अंदर जो मिला है सडनली मछली रातों रात खत्म हो गई सेकेंड चीज ये हुआ कि जब एक और जो अच्छी चीज जो निकल के आया वही था कि लोकल जिस विलेज में हो रहा है उस विलेज के लोगों ने टेंडर नहीं लिया है आउट ऑफ विलेज के लोगों ने टेंडर लिया है ये चीजें कैसे कोरिलेट करती हैं वो चीजों को समझने की जब बाहर से हुआ है और उसका जो इफेक्ट हुआ है वो केवल डाई ही एक इफेक्ट नहीं है सेकेंडली उसका टेस्ट जो लोगों ने शेयर किया है उसमें यह भी निकला है कि टेस्ट इतना खराब है कि नियरेस्ट मार्केट में रेगुलर सेलिंग भी नहीं हो रहा है तो शायद वो लाइवलीहुड को सीधा सीधा कनेक्ट कर रहा है ये फिशरीज पे पड़ा और एनिमल हजबेंड्री पे भी ये चीज कर रहा है कि 
एनिमल हस्बेंड्री में जो जो सवाल है उसमें जो जनरेशन गैप के बीच में एनिमल हस्बेंड्री को समझने की कोशिश करते हैं तो एक सिंपल सा सवाल कि एक एवरेज एज क्या होता है बफेलो का या गाय का शायद ये सवालों का जवाब लेने के लिए हमको 50 प्लस जो रेस्पोंडेंट है एज जिसका एज 50 प्लस है वो ऐसे लोगों के साथ बात कर रहा हूँ तो कुछ ये सुनने को मिला कि वास्तव में बफेलो या काउ का कोई एवरेज एज भी होता है तो कितना जो अवेयरनेस और ये सब चीजें बोलेंगे बहुत छोटे वर्ड है शायद क्योंकि बहुत डीप में जाके ये सब बताने की जरूरत लास्ट जो चीज करी है कि हम लोग कम्युनिटी में अवेयरनेस और ये सब चीजें के लिए जब बात कर रहे हैं तो ये सिचुएशन लकीली जिस दिन हम लोग जिस गांव में थे वहीं पर ये सुनने को आया इंडस्ट्री की वजह से जो वेस्ट हो रहा है पूरा पॉइंट के साथ डिपेंड हो रहा है लोग इतने अवेयर हैं कि सीधा एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन के पास गए हैं एसडीएम के पास गए हैं बड़ा सा एक मीटिंग हो रहा है लेकिन ये सब होने के बाद भी कहीं से कोई भी पॉजिटिव सपोर्ट नहीं है तो ये जो बहुत छोटे छोटे से ऑब्जर्वेशन है ऑब्जर्वेशन में दूसरी चीजें ये रहना कि हाँ लेडीज का इन्वॉल्वमेंट है मैं एग्रीकल्चर के बोल रहा हूँ कि लोगों का महिलाओं का बहुत बड़ा कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन है एग्रीकल्चर फील्ड में वो सब कुछ काम करते हैं लेकिन जब उनसे इस तरीके से पूछा गया कि आपका लैंड कितना है तो शायद आंसर नहीं है तो और फिर जब इसका आंसर नहीं है तो एल्ड कितना हुआ है क्या लॉस हुआ है कितना मार्केट वैल्यू होता है जबकि ओवरऑल मोर देन मैं एमपी और राजस्थान के बात में बोल रहा हूँ कि मोर देन एट्टी परसेंट ऑफ एग्रीकल्चर वर्क महिलाओं के पास है सो थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच So hello everyone. Uh, I am Ankita Yadav from WOTR. Uh, I just want to share an experience share with you that we have been working on farm ponds in Maharashtra. I come from Maharashtra, and uh, so the farm ponds are something that it's a mitigation measure that is pushed through state government and even the central government largely. Uh, they are huge in number, and even the surface area that is exposed to you know. Uh, atmosphere is huge. One farm pond goes beyond one acre of size, and there are so many in numbers. The problem with the farm ponds that when we we were studying the farm ponds, we had two studies, two different studies. Almost except for the western Maharashtra, entire remaining Maharashtra is you know overlain with these farm ponds. They are in lakhs. And the problem that people were sharing, it's just not one or two farmers. Farmers are sharing that the quantity of water in the farm pond, since these are lined with plastic lining, the pH of that water is changing. And the same thing, water goes to irrigation. Also, since these are you know mitigation strategy and uh, they are particular for a semi-arid region, uh, this this water is also used for livestock. At the same time, the evaporation rate is so high. People are using castor oil or some chemicals they that they are getting from market. They are putting it onto the surface of the water. So again, it is you know coupled with number of other things and uh, the quality of water is getting you know, so bad. And uh, since there is no particular research onto this type of water that how it is getting impacted. Um, there is no, you know, uh, solution of it. And then, since it is policy or program uh, promoted by the government, there is no one, you know, uh, coming forward to have this kind of research. Which is Alka, it. Yeah, I think Alka. I think it's in there. Uh, the uh, water quality standards which you showed for animal status versus humans. Can you please tell me broadly what could be the difference in standards? Uh -huh. That is the first question. There are two, three more questions. Uh, second question is about industrial pollution. And uh, so basically, uh, when industrial contaminants are uh, polluting groundwater, have you, like, when in your survey, have you seen pockets where the impact is different as compared to domestic pollution on cattle? 
when they drink that water, that is the second question. Third question is about rural, urban pollution going to rural areas and contaminating. So, what are the scenarios in these three things? Wow. Yeah, the first one, this animal water quality, right? So, there doesn't seem to be a consensus on that. I think people are, different countries are following different standards. It is, I think, uh, um, I mean, there is some kind of a to and fro between it. Uh, but roughly, I think for most of these parameters, I think I remember seeing it as twice or thrice the threshold for most of them. Um, as I remember, uh, broadly, you know, the limits, like if it is 1 ppm, then it is 2.5. It's uh, something like that. Yeah. That kind of makes a adoption on a, almost a message that they are less sensitive. With exactly, but it also depends on the size of the animal and which animal yeah. and all of that. Right? Uh, because also the human standards are all made for 50 kilogram healthy adult. Right? Even the human standards are made for 50. So if it's a 10 kg child, you are sometimes five times more exposed to it. Um, secondly, uh, I think industrial contaminants very broadly, because I think the examples that we spoke about, uh, pharmaceutical industry and uh, dyeing industry. Um, so you can see it in front. The, I think the broader thing we are seeing is that these industries and smaller industries are moving more rural because of power availability, water availability. Uh, so you are seeing more of these smaller industries now also within villages. So they are generating waste locally. So it's not just domestic waste. The example that she gave and some zones, for example, if you take coastal Gujarat, so coastal Gujarat, there has been a conscious plan you not know, to have industries. So there are also certain areas where rural, you will not see it anywhere, but then suddenly it will be inside the village. So I, I maybe I'm not fully right, but industrial contamination, you could see the effects even more you know, clearly. Um, what, sorry, what, what was it? Uh, Urban. So yeah, I mean, all of so all of all of the all of the things that we saw are all quite rural. I mean, they are not even close to urban. So okay. these are all. Uh, so I you know none of these except for I mean it's a totally different story with Bangalore and Chikbalapur. Right? I mean it's extraordinarily treated water which is going into Chikbalapur. So it's one of the places where study happened. Otherwise, yeah, Nalgunda. This is like a entire pharma hub of. Um, of, of Hyderabad, it's concentrated pharma hub directly going from there into farmers are accepting it because that is only water that we have. So this is in Nalgunda. Yes, Nancy. Uh, yeah, so yeah, Nancy. Uh, Good to see the conversation. This is Nancy from Nalgunda Foundation. It's good to see conversation running between women, human. Uh, animal and it's first time I'm seeing that all conversations it's at least going on. My question is to uh, both Nafisa and Nikolavia, and I'm taking the point from where you left and uh, taking the gender aspect again, and particularly women, because we are not still talking about men in water. We are still keep talking about women in water, and most of the disasters are man-made disasters, but no offense to any men. Uh, but uh, uh, Nafisa will for so many years, this has talk has been going on that there needs to be more attention on women. And when, when I'm linking it with what uh, Nabia was saying, when we have uh, all kinds of disasters for that matter, because I've started a new project, uh, women are anyway disproportionately affected. But then uh, if you put the layer of disaster, whether it is water pollution, flood, or any kind of contamination, uh, the, the, the extra burden also gets into the woman. So I just want to understand from all of you, because you have been working on field for so many years, what is it stopping uh, or where is the wall that we are unable to really get across and make the point heard in the policy and practice? So many of you are working for so many years. Why, why are we not able to uh, bring it? Uh, I mean, I think the problem is more than patriarchy also. Even in this group, in last next three, in three days, there's no session on women. Uh, just, yes, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, 
Martin, the way uh, we look at it, and I'm sure that many of us here, we look at an issue in a more integrated way, right? It is never just one aspect. If I'm talking about, or women are saying that this pollution, it's not just women who are saying, um, men are also saying that yes, there is this pollution. But the way women behave and men behave are different. Who goes to negotiate with the uh, companies, you know, in terms of kya pia nahi karenge, all that, men go. They don't allow women to go. Of course, where we have the very strong women groups and, you know, women leadership, they go and kind of negotiate. But then, Pichle Dor say, who takes the money and, uh, you know, break the movement? Mostly it's men. I mean, so that is one other. So there are these social processes and issues which are also linked to political. I mean, there are political issues because who gives permission to these factories and who kind of, uh, uh, you know, pulls the uh, uh, wool over their eye in terms of seeing that so much pollution by contamination by the factories and the, I mean, all the kind of corporates which is going uh, in the water bodies. And uh, we have a what I mean, uh, a board, I mean, layer of pollution, the water pollution board. And you talk to those people and they say that, okay, you want us to write a report. Our report will go out of the window and we will also go out of the window. So this huge, what I'm trying to tell you is because you're asking why uh, we can't do something about it. I mean, is there a policy? Is there not a policy? I'm sure there's a policy. There is a policy that you cannot, uh, uh, you know, these people cannot pollute water or water bodies and there are uh, stricter, uh, you know, penalties and this and that. They will come. They just go over it. So, that, so it is a huge political problem. The way I look at it, I'm talking about Gujarat, I'm sure but this is also. But it is, uh, it is a I mean, it is a combination of social processes uh, you know, and, and the political processes. So, you know, things that uh, what Igor was talking about, that, you know, there are these disasters like droughts and floods and all that. And those communities who live there, I mean, I'm talking about both women and men, you know, they know what are possible alternatives and, of course, with better solutions. I mean, they, they're ready to accept and adapt and all that. But things which is, which is beyond them, I mean, how do you prevent a huge water body, uh, you know, uh, how do you protect that water body from uh, getting this kind of pollution because they go and dump it at night. And it's a, it's a huge because there is a lot of vandalism, you know, into that whole thing. It's, it's a lot of muscle power. So so the thing is, the answer, uh, well, if we say you, uh, the ministers are there, departments are there, policy is there, and why it's not being implemented? It's not that people have not given complaints and women have not gone and all that. But the kind of pressure which has to really come on the policy maker. Today, you know, it's very brilliantly, I was uh, like, even in Antarctic University, I showed that slide. It is said 100% Jaljivan mission, 100% families are uh, connected with water. And we, we know what how, how much truth is in that, you know, either that, uh, you know, the, the, the pipe is there in the, in the house and then nothing is, it's not connected with any water supply. All the water goes, I mean, there was a report by yourself in, in Gujarat that a three person water was, um, uh, you know, of uh, not, not drinkable. I mean, from this pipe, right? So which means that there is a denial that no, there, there is no issue, there's no problem. And when people, so I'm just trying to uh, kind of uh, you know, answer your question that the kind of pressure to me, the pressure which has to go on government is not enough. That's why I said, how does it pressure me? So we sometimes, I feel that, okay, we researchers. We huh? research, we have to research, you publish it and you say, okay, this is what it is, this is how bad it is, and so nothing. I mean, what is the, where is that power coming, for, you know, from these 
I'm, I'm not just saying this, but that different communities to exert pressure on government. And because there, there is a thing, I mean, this is the same area where there was a huge, huge movement against Nirma and nuclear plants, right? I mean, because people wanted to protect their, uh, you know, and these are uh, women's groups and they just got together and they did it. They could do it in 2013. They could do it in 2008, 9, 10, you know, all the protests and all this. Now, it's not possible. So I'm Without saying much, I'm saying a lot. Just, uh, just to add, because uh, there was a discussion here that women are doing a lot of things on the ground. Uh, that is where Iklavi and Yumi may just uh, add the nuance. That somewhere they are reluctant in those, uh, uh, you know, uh, numbers and taking uh, empowered, empowering themselves with the loyalty, how much pollution, how much land they have, how much food they have. Does that keep them back? And uh, because I, I'm, I'm really realizing it now in Manipur and uh, Kalimpong, where we just started, we just started the project. That woman actually knows a lot. It's just that their words don't get into the papers. Over to you. Uh, since 2005, uh, while working in Africa, is the evolution of politics of filters. Okay. There has been a conscious decision to refer to women when the medium, but not to include them when it happens to be sourcing the information to them, giving credit to them. Now, I'm, I'm talking slightly abstract, let me give an example. <clears throat> when Make by the Bihan started work, we used to consider plants as a uniform entity in the entire Mokita. We failed, we resurrected, and we tried to understand why did we fail, and then we realized that in Bihar and North Bihar, there are no uniform floods, there are typology of floods. How did we get to know what the typology The majority of one particular gender staying in the village and experiencing floods, whether it's pre, during, post, happens to be women. Now, if we are hesitant enough to spend time with patients to get information from them, and we would like to have a quick fix kind of an input coming from a person who has had the experience of floods about five years back, but it's still a villager compared to that of a woman who has been there for a who has been surviving in that scenario in different times. So that is one filter that has been used. For our we do not have the patience to go through and to wait. Uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, I was working uh, for NDMA to come up with the policy and the guidelines on uh, mitigation and resettlement of people affected by floods. As for uh, affected by river erosion and coastal erosion. And NDMA's dictate was that we are going to bring this entire policy bottoms up and we de develop a whole system of doing it, in which household interview was the make was the movie, I would say the mainstay of the entire work. And Household interview was largely with women. So the agencies that were trying to, you know, uh, execute this were hesitant because of the fact that information wouldn't have come. We were we are doing the eighth typology of floods in Bihar, and we were doing the same of going down to the household level to get information, and women did, were able to give almost about half an hour max in a day to answer your questions. So, in the entire scenario, what is happening is it's all about filters and convenience. Where do you get information? How, how do you manage things? I mean, why is it so that despite women being the main, uh, you know, um, group who have experienced floods in different forms, are still not being considered when we are talking about, say, sanitation, when we are talking about uh, drinking water, why aren't they being brought into the forefront? Forget about those groups or those 
membership, I mean, you know, community is not, that's not the point. And I'm talking very specific to these disaster flood prone areas where you don't see much happening. So my point is that unless and until efforts are made, conscious efforts are made and you talk about it, then only such things will trickle down. And at least now, for instance, people they re they're realizing now that you know if you if you don't you know, involve women when you're talking and trying to understand that the these researchers are understanding. That if you don't involve women in terms of understanding cuts not from those three months for the entire event of the year, then things are going to be good. But still, there's a long way to go. I mean, still there's a long way because we have a lot of filters with us. So. Thank you, Akira. And with that, can I request that you can already talk like a few minutes into it and have to offer another time set? We'll be late for last as well as for the next week. So that's it's not one question. We have a lot of Guidelines and decisions I have brought. A lot of thought has been, uh, I would say, ignited here. First of all, thank you to Amy and Linda for picking up this other session. And thanks to all our esteemed panelists, as well as everyone who presented and who may not have gotten a chance to present for the end kind of it. My apologies. Uh, what I'm going to do now in the next two minutes is quickly uh, sort of pick up some of the points that were made today. Uh, not necessarily saying the order reflects any kind of uh, the uh, value judgment on the quality or the contribution of any of this. Uh, I guess we started very simply by putting the question to say what's happening to animals, what's happening to the land, what's happening to uh, even the uh, you know the data when you look at the macro level. What are the trends which are showing saying livelihood uh, is getting affected because of water quality? And this is being done in this room where the other side is very well known. Like Sundar was saying initially, saying putting livelihood in the center. Because we all know many of the livelihood choices are also affecting water quality. But putting that aside for a while, because 98% of the time the conversation is there, saying how water quality can be uh, you know, uh, detected, saying it's bad, and then how it can be cured and all of that, and prevention also becomes part of that conversation. But today the conversation very interestingly kept the focus at how livelihood is getting affected because of water quality. Now, some of the things, um, I would actually like to emphasize what Nafisa then started with. The point is communities have done all that they can. I think I'll try and bring two or three of these examples together in one single sentence. I think what we are struggling with it, how do we get a state to account to people, right? How do we get pollution control board to actually deliver? And this is not necessarily one place or two places. And yes, there is politics to it. Yes, there is a well, social dimension to it. Yes, there is a, a special gender uh, issue to here. But again, one of the things that we keep reminding ourselves, the contexts are very different. Like I think Amita also spoke, uh, sometimes generalization leads to saying something that has been successful in Karnataka. Let's make that same thing happen in Maharashtra. You don't realize the transportation is higher, temperatures are higher, and your farm ports are not going to bring you the same result. Uh, the second point I want to bring from is where Alpha started by saying, at least in her data set, uh, at least 40 percent uh, was the water that was going untreated, and 60 percent was the water that was getting some degree of treatment. Uh, a couple of years back, I was witnessing uh, with like one of the audiences on uh, Namami Gangi initial mapping presentation. Uh, is there the way around? So at least 60% is unpeated. So, no, 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 only Amdabar data I am talking about. Yeah, I picked up because otherwise the numbers were difficult for me to quickly do it. So Amdabar data, what she presented, seems to suggest that 40% unpeated, 60% peated. Uh, Namaki Gange initial mapping, what I remember is, uh, it was showing that the capacity itself was only the one third of what was being generated. And then of which only about 40% was social. So you were down to like 12%, 15% really being treated in any meaningful manner. But I don't know from where we have we come today. So it would be wrong to carry any of these data again. And this is the, to the point of generalization, I think, right? Uh, but uh, the other piece, which I think Vishnath has brought in, and in fact, two points I'm picking up from Vishnath. The one is the broader schema of one half, because we are all talking about the interconnections. 
uh, and this is going to improve water quality to livelihood, livelihood to the other aspects of uh, you know even the collective life and uh, all the way to democratic accountability that we ended up talking about, right? But the second point, which was made by Vishnath, was about the risk-based approach versus a standard-based approach. Because I think even the example that Nidhi gave, then access over quality is a very clear risk-based approach. They may not have that vocabulary, they may not be using that, but they're applying something, right? And similarly, again, this kind of goes back to the previous point of making it contextual. Uh, this debate has gotten started, this conversation has gotten started is a very happy, uh, I would say, moment that uh, this has triggered many thoughts. At the same time, because we are all water professionals, I mean, people who are with water and livelihood uh, land practices, we also need to sort of keep reminding ourselves none of this is going to be a, a magic one. Lastly, I think, uh, to me, uh, even the example that came from Arvind and Libby, what you spoke of, saying there is a, not only gender, there is a color dimension to the problem, right? Uh, so there's this whole equity issue, and is the research actually being directed? So very fact saying we're talking of cattle now, and Krishna, you are hopeful saying we can get JDM to account for at least livestock water requirement, right? Uh, I mean, I would say my position at the moment, at least my gut says, saying that's going to be difficult. Because even in the current scheme, delivering 55 LDCD, I think that itself is uh, going to be a challenge. But you might get it in policy. Uh, I don't know where all you'll be able to deliver. So that's one uh, sort of apprehension or reservation I have. But I just wanted to, buy. you seem to be wanting to respond to that. Yeah. Okay. So, and the last thing, again, uh, I guess, uh, to me, if you are saying what is standing out, what is standing out to us as an issue is not only the first frame, which is, is the quality related or quality affecting level. I think we are establishing, yes, it is affecting. Even with the limited data we are establishing, it is affecting. But do we need more evidence? Do we need more research? Obviously, we need more research. But at least the pain point that I would like to underline that I am hearing, uh, as civil society, while we are good at finding out these problems, doing some a small scale solution, are we getting the state to account to civil society or to people in any large scalable manner? I think that's a bigger question that's being raised. Uh, it's not a one day thing, it's not a one session thing. Thank you for all of your participation. I hope I did not take more than six minutes. Thank you, everyone.